we all know what are these NOACs. NOACs means is new oral anticoagulants, which includes dabigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, edoxaban. So one common question which comes to our mind always is, what about the co complications? What about the problems if we are trying to take these medicine? So, so what may always happen is, yes, if uh, someone may take really very high doses, complications like bleeding may also happen. So for that, one of the things you need to inquire about it is, you should try to inquire when was the last dosage which was taken. You should also try to see for the renal function. What about the renal parameters? Is it normal? Is it good or is it becoming less? So you have to see for those parameters as well. Similarly, if someone is, is taking dabigatran, you should try to see for RBC substitution if it is needed. Similarly, if possible, substitute the platelets. And also, if possible, use fresh frozen plasma as plasma expander. Yes, but if uh, uh, the bleeding complications are becoming really high, you may consider also using transexamic acid as well. Or if really something very severe, desmopressin can be used. Although there are cases in which, in cases of problems, even dialysis was used as well. So, as, as we had said, it, if someone is still bleeding and all, so when you have already considered everything, whichever is mentioned over here, other than that, still the patient is having problems. So what are you... What will you try to consider? You can try to use this prothrombin complex concentrate in the dosage of 25 units per gram, which can be used. Although there are no evidences for that, but you may try to consider about it. So to summarize, it will always, your action plan always depends upon, is it a mild bleeding, moderate, or even life-threatening? So moderate, as we had said, it always try to use for mechanical compression, surgical hemostasis you may also consider for fluid replacement as well and it also try to substitute the rbcs or with fresh frozen plasmas as well but for dabigatran you should be sure that you are maintaining good adequate diuresis you may consider even hemodialysis as well otherwise some of the uh, things which is available as i said it PCC can be used or activated PCC also can be used. But what about if you're trying to plan a surgical intervention or maybe an ablation procedure? Now, the current understanding is if a patient is supposed to undergo an ablation procedure, no need to stop the NOAC. It should be not at all interrupted. The earlier thinking was at least for warfarin and all, if someone is on warfarin, you may stop it like at least 24 hours before the procedure. Or maybe skip the morning uh, or the last evening dose and you can take them up for the procedure. But not for this. And now what happens is, in fact, uh, now if uh, you are planning a dental intervention like a incisional abscess, periodontal surgery, no need to actually stop. Even for a cataract or glaucoma intervention as well, no need to stop, in fact, okay? Or maybe just six hours before the procedure, you can stop. So even the surgical interventions for your own convenience, you can try to divide it in low risk or the high risk. Low risk procedures are like the endoscopy with biopsy or bladder biopsy or EP study or RF ablation as well. For example, if it is S for SVT and all, or even angiography. So over there still you may maintain, but conditions like high risk, like complex left-sided ablation, pulmonary vein isolation or VT ablation as well, thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery or major orthopedic surgery as well. So for those things, you will have to really a little bit careful as I said it. So when you stop the dosage as well, it is dependent on the creatinine clearance of the patient. So as you may notice over here, if someone is at high risk, you may consider 48 hours, 
for normal patients you can stop it but if it is someone at low risk even 24 hours is pretty good enough actually similarly if you are trying to uh, if you have done a procedure for example like a lumbar puncture uh, then you can immediately resume six to eight hours after the surgery and then next next slide can we go to the next slide please next further next 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 doctor uh, which slide is please keep going please keep going and i'll tell you please keep going to the next 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 stop 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 oh gosh you are going so quick Ugh, you have gone too far okay just be there no problem be at the scenario i'll come over there so now since we have a little bit don't move please yeah let it be at the scenario one so as i had said it uh, now you are able to understand when to start when to stop these uh, anticoagulants but a lot of times so what is going to happen is if you come across a patient who has atrial fibrillation and coronary heart disease so what you may have to do over the, in those conditions so over there you will have to really ask if the patient has a ST elevation or non ST elevation although both these conditions are associated with very high mortality risk and further if you want to see the risk these risks are associated if someone has a lot of co comorbidities as well so they will be having a lot of problems as well and as we all know triple therapy with vitamin k, k antagonists tend to double the risk of bleeding in fact and that is the reason so from especially there is some data from Rely trial which suggests that Novaks are better if you are trying to put a patient on dual or triple therapy actually although there is no clinical data as such in fact and as I said it we are lacking on a lot of data as well for such kind of things but yes as I had said it uh, NOAX should be considered or preferred for such conditions in, indeed. Okay. Then, now coming to the scenarios. What about the, if you come across a scenario in which, uh, if, as I said it, if the patient of atrial fibrillation who is on NOAC but has an acute coronary syndrome. So, what will be done? So, that moment, Temporarily, you can stop the NOAC when the patient presents and you can initiate the dual antiplatelet therapy unless, unless there is, if a patient is having the high bleeding risk, you should not. Okay? Did you understand? This is a very important thing. So you should temporarily stop the NOAC, dual antiplatelet should be started unless or until the patient has very high bleeding risk then you should give low dose aspirin low dose means 150 to 300 milligram and after that you may give like 75 to 100 milligram later on admission you should combine it with ticagrelor or prosegrel rather than clopidogrel okay if the patient has st elevation mi should try to avoid unfraction heparin or inoxaparin until the NOAC effect disappears and if it is a non ST elevation MI you should try you know try to delay the coronary angiography till the NOAC effect has gone okay did you understand so if ST elevation MI has happened try to prefer the radial approach avoid the unfraction heparin okay and if it is non-ST elevation MI, the best will be, of course, is yeah, try to wait till the time when the NOAC effect has gone. 
Okay, next slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next slide. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. So now what about the recommendations? So if, as I had said it, so what about, so as I already said it, try to always prefer a radial approach. Angioplasty should be preferred rather than stenting. Okay. And if you really have to use stents, bare metal stents should be used. And GP2B 3A inhibitors should be avoided. Otherwise, what happens is the risk of bleeding is very high in these conditions. Next, next slide. And then, especially for patients who require revascularization, bypass may be preferred, okay? But in selected patients, as I had said, it, bleeding risk may be high. And if, when you are thinking of restarting NOACs, should try to put them on lower dosage according to the risk and what are you trying to do actually as i had said it okay and newer platelet inhibitors especially like ticagrel law prosegrel have not yet been evaluated for that so maybe it's better to wait let's not be too aggressive next slide especially if you come across a af patient in which less than one year acs has happened so in those kind of patients, so if there's a uh, if there is a patient in which uh, if it is up to six months in case of a recent drug eluting stent, you can consider vitamin K antagonists in monotherapy, especially when the bleeding risk has elevated. Okay, but however, if you calculate the gray score, if it is more than 118 you should use additional single platelet therapy. And in that, you should always prefer clopidogrel, not any other medicine. Did you understand? So for example, it will, your strategy also depends upon the what kind of bleeding score you are trying to use. For example, you, you are using has blood score and the scoring is more than three. Then what you should do is vitamin K antagonists you should use in monotherapy, especially for the first three months. But if someone is using a drug eluting instead, initial six months, okay? Now, if NOAC is indicated, you should prefer for a factor 10A inhibitor, which is not only small, but also there's minimum risk, especially for uh, myocardial infarction, especially for dabigatran, although a lot of clinical benefit is not there. And if dabigatran is indicated, you should try to use then 100 milligram, 110 milligram BD is better. Okay. And if you want to combine further, then you can combine with low dose aspirin, especially or you can also combine it with the clopidogrel. In fact, if you are thinking of using rivaroxaban in, com in combination with dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, although it has not been yet been used, but there are some favorable data, especially for the rivaroxaban. Although we are still waiting for a lot of results to come up, actually. And anticoagulation without additional antiplatelet agents is sufficient for most AF patients without stable coronary artery disease. And advantages of NOAX over vitamin K antagonists is likely to be preserved. And NOAX may be safe and effective alternatives for vitamin K antagonists. And there's no preference given to any of the NOACs. And if you are using dabigatran, as we already said it, try to use a lower dose, and you may also mix it up with low dose aspirin. So if you will notice in these slides, what has been the differences, your strategy depends, is it less than one, acute MI, or more than one years, more than one years, as I said it, you can just use only low dose aspirin or maybe even clopidogrel and a lower dosage of NOAC in fact. But in uh, the other thing was if it is less than one year, 
as I had said it, try to calculate the Hasblad score. In Hasblad score, so what may, you should do is, you should prefer his vitamin K antagonist only, especially for the first two, three months, okay? So, next slide. Next. Next. Okay. So what about the role of cardioversion in a NOAC treated patient? As I had said it, if you are, if NOAC is undergoing for a patient, no need to be worried about. You can directly take them for ablation. But what about a cardioversion? So for cardioversion, it has been shown that a patient for in AF more than 48 hours, if you're planning a cardioversion, you should give oral anticoagulation minimum is three weeks, minimum. And after that, after the cardioversion, minimum is four weeks after the cardioversion. It should be taken. And although the clinical data has not shown much of benefit compared to the vitamin K antagonists, compared to the NOAX. And when, what about when a patient has come to you with acute stroke? When the patient is on NOAC, what would you do? Acute hemorrhagic stroke. Next slide. Next. Yeah. So what you sh should do for acute hemorrhagic stroke, immediately stop the NOAC. Okay. And in if you want to manage them acutely, you can use fresh frozen plasma or packed cells. If it is an acute ischemic stroke, you should try to assess the time window since the last intake of NOAC. Okay, because thrombolytic therapy is associated with increased bleeding risk when you use it within 48 hours of the last NOAC dose. Similarly, if you are not sure about the last dosage, even prolonged APTT or PT will also indicate that thrombolysis should not be given. Okay, next slide. If you come across a hemorrhagic stroke. Next slide. Yeah. So then you should try to see for what about the cardioembolic risk? Is If it is high or is it low? And if the cardioembolic risk is high and the risk for hemorrhage is low, you can start the NOAC like up to uh, two weeks after the intracerebral hemorrhage. But for patients with lower cardioembolic risk and higher bleeding risk, you should be careful in re-initiation of the NOAX. And maybe don't use NOAX unless bleeding risk has been reversed. And you may consider using non-pharmacological steroids now, strategies for example ablation otherwise even occlusion of the atrial appendage so this is one of the classical indications for the left atrial appendage occlusion so what is the the indication is as i had said it you should stop the NOAC when the patient is already taking this and in this and in this maybe you may also consider mechanical thrombectomy without thrombolysis so coming to the stroke patients, what would you do, especially in the post-acute phase? In the post-acute phase, if it is a ischemic stroke, and if the infarct size does not increase the risk of secondary intracerebral bleeding, you may reinitiate it. Like at least if it is a TIA after one day, if it is small, non-disabling infarct after three days, if it is a large infarct, then yeah, not before two, two weeks at least. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And if it's a TIA of cardioembolic origin, you may restart the NOAX as soon as possible. And do not, there's no need for low molecular weight heparin bridging at all. So, as we had already said it, next slide. So the initiation of the NOAX depends upon the infarct size and also the risk of new embolic stroke. 
and you may consider if the patient has AF and significant carotid stenosis, carotid in the arterectomy and also and not stenting is recommended to avoid triple therapy. So especially as we all know patients who are having malignant conditions they are at very high risk for thromboembolic events. Even tumors may secrete prothrombotic factors or induce inflammatory response and cancer therapy which inflicts the bleeding risk through surgery, tissue damage, irradiation or myelosuppression and many malignancies are associated with increased risk of mucosal bleeding. Chemotherapy causes myelosuppression uh, in the form of reduced platelet counts which may reduce the RBCs and also reduce safety margin in a bleeding event and you should next slide you should consider multiple disciplinary approach by trying to involve an oncologist and of course a cardiologist as well next slide next slide next So, uh, in, as, I, as I was telling you, in patients with cancer, you should try to make a multidisciplinary team and also you should not use low molecular weight heparin if you are using a NOAC. And especially when someone is receiving myelosuppressive therapy, NOAC may be continued although. While if you are trying to consider if the patient is undergoing tumor surgery, same principle you may apply as in elective surgery okay so if there is a patient who is undergoing myelosuppressive chemotherapy or radiation therapy you should you may consider temporary dose reduction or cessation of no acts you should try to see regular blood clouds bleeding signs and liver and renal function you may also consider gastric protection with proton pump inhibitors or also H2 blockers. Next, so we all, as we all know, with atrial fibrillation there is thromboembolic risk and if there is a stent, yes there is thrombosis risk and if you try to use triple oral anticoagulants, yes there is risk for the bleeding. Next slide. So this is what is called as, what we call it as CHAT slash 2 scoring. So which stands for congestive heart failure, hypertension, age more than 75. So these people have a higher bleeding risk actually. Diabetes, stroke, okay, and sex category. So for example, if it is a female, only for female you will give 1. If it is a male patient, you will be giving 0. Next slide. So the older scoring, what was called as CHATS2 versus CHATS2. So I will tell you CHATS2 is outdated. You should not even look at that scoring at all. Next slide. So this is a, a very uh, classical uh, scenario which you may come across. Next slide. So if you come across, a, for example, a clinical scenario you come across, age more than 75, you should give oral anticoagulation, yes. If it is no, then you should try to Dr. look. Dr. Narendra, yeah, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. Dr. Narendra, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your voice is breaking, doctor. Okay. Uh, we are not able to hear clearly. Clearly? Okay. Um, <sighs> Okay. Like for example, if you are telling next slide, it says next, then it breaks for a pass, then it comes for slide. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Maybe the university should supply us high-speed internet connection as well for us, because we cannot depend upon our own ones. Okay, is there any change now? Is the connection? Is the voice better now? Now it is also the same doctor. 
because from my side when i'm trying to see the internet speed it shows high speed students you are you able to hear clearly students are you able to hear clearly no ma'am breaking it's breaking when i'm hearing you guys it's coming very clearly actually okay anyways we are there in the last five slides so we'll be finishing it very soon now so we are about to finish actually so we are really in the last few slides it's not far away so okay uh, so what i was telling is if age is more than 75 you must start because age more than 75 gets score of 2 similarly if patient has had history of tia stroke or embolism you should again start them on anticoagulation and as i had said it females will be having a higher risk so that's why you will consider for them as well if so now the next next slide as we can see in these slides this is more of a summary of what we have already spoken before so if it is a bare metal stent okay so you should give them uh, you know uh noax or uh, the other anticoagulation for 4 to 6 weeks and then only on anti uh, only on aspirin itself you can continue them similarly if it is a drug eluting stent you should ha you have to give anticoagulation for a much longer time in fact similarly non st elevation mi only you know 12 months is enough dual antiplatelets is enough did you are you able to understand this slide as i said it so this 4 to 6 weeks is the duration for dual antiplatelets if a bare metal stent is used if it is a drug eluting stent at least 12 months a non st elevation mi 12 months st elevation mi 12 months okay and uh, next slide okay so at, as i had said chats vas 2 scoring is key to start any anticoagulation if it is low risk only dual antiplatelets is enough but if it is moderate risk with bare metal with warfarin you can give for one month of dual antiplatelet okay if it is drug eluting stent you have to give it for longer time okay and noax although has not been used next so recently maybe you all would be knowing that uh, there are some antagonists as well which has come up so which is called as idrocizumab so this is actually approved for dabigatran so are you aware of any other uh inhibitory agents for the noax so for example as i have shown in the slide idrasizumab is one of the agents okay if you want to counteract the effect of dabigatran you can use this molecule are you aware of any other molecule yeah so this is one of the molecule as i had said it which is shown as well so at least for dabigatran you should this is the molecule which you are going to use so regarding the this is what is called as antidotes so the antidotes for them is as i had said it this is very very minimum in fact they are trying to use a lot of uh, antidotes but it will still take time but on a universal basis if you are trying to use a molecule which you can use it for any noac it is called as aripazine you all may write it down aripazine it's a very important molecule 
it is more uh, yeah it's uh, this also this antidote tends to bind to the factor 10a inhibitor and for dabigatran through the hydrogen bonds and that is how it can reverse the anticoagulant effects of not only dabigatran rivaroxaban or even apixaban in fact for most of the molecule so the wonder molecule which is called as if you want to reverse of any of the effects of the NOAC, you have to use what is called as aripazine aripazine so uh, i think now we are almost towards the end of the slide next slide please okay uh, does anyone have any questions so far I must tell to everyone that uh, this slides were a little bit really heavy content I must